Um, so, uh, so now the first talk will be given by uh, Dr. Ricardo Coronado Leia. Uh, Dr. Ricardo uh, Coronado, Coronado Leia is a postdoctoral postdoctoral research fellow at the Bernard and Irene Schwartz Center for Biomedical Imaging, Department of Radiology uh, at New York University Grossman School of Medicine. He holds a master's degree in computer science and industrial mathematics, and a PhD in computer science from the Center of Research in Mathematics in Mexico. He worked as postdoctoral researcher at the Neurobiology Institute of the National Autonomous University of Mexico, and his current work focuses uh, on the characterization of brain white matter microstructure in, neuro in neurodegener neuro neurodegenerative diseases using diffusion MRI and validating uh, with histology and Mont Monte Carlo simulation. And today he will be talking about uh, validation of white matter microstructure metrics from diffusion uh, MRI. So with that, uh, please, uh, Dr. Coronado lay up, the uh, floor is yours. Um, we can't hear you. So first, sorry, first of all, thank you very much for the introduction and thank you very much for the invitation to this conference. I'm honored. Uh, so I will talk in about validation of white matter microstructure metrics from diffusion MRI. So, um, so diffusion MRI is sensitive to the random water, to the random movement of water molecules. Now, this is because the mean displacement of this uh, random moment is uh, is uh, given by the by the diffusion and by the the diffusion diffusion time, and knowing that the diffusion in, in water the diffusion water in uh, the diffusion of the water in tissues is around one micrometer square uh, per millisecond, and the the clinic the the usual diffusion time that are using clinic are between one and one thousand milliseconds. That means that or that. Uh, with diffusion MRI, we are sensitive in, in this uh, for lens case of this range between one and fifteen micrometers. This is two between two and three orders below the MRI resolution. So that means that diffusion MRI is some sort of a super resolution technique in which we go from the microscopic resolution that is in millimeter from from MRI images, and we go to the micro, micro micrometer uh, resolution that that mesoscopic, mesoscopic, the mesoscopic resolution. That means that we are sensitive. To the to the to uh, to these lens scales at the cellular level, so diffusion MRI is an is an excellent uh, method in order to measure tissue microstructure. However, it's still an indirect method in the sense that we still need to to uh, identify and extract the relevant information from the diffusion MRI uh, signal. Now, in this case, we have two ways in which we can uh, study the diffusion MRI signal. One is by means of representations. This is we we can uh, decompose or, or map or diffusion signal in some sort of basis in which we can obtain certain parameters. Here, the most widely recognized is the cumulant expansion, you know, from diffusion tensor and diffusion kurtosis, from which several param we can obtain several parameters, such as you know, the fractional anisotropy or the principal diffusion direction or the uh, mean and uh, mean kurtosis, I mean diffusivity. Now, the, the, good, the, the advantage of these metrics is that they are sensitive. I mean, like, uh, they they um, they sensitive out to the changes in microstructure. There are many examples in literature, but here I am, uh, I will comment just on two, in which uh, in a Cuprison uh, model for, for the millination, we observe that these, these, uh, these metrics uh, are sensitive to the, to the acute inflammatory stage and the uh, uh, um, chronic uh, degenerative stage. Now, in, in another study for using a traumatic brain injury model, we can observe that these metrics can differentiate between uh, between the baseline and seven days post injury. So, yes, these metrics, the metrics obtained from DTI and DTI, are sensitivity, but still they lack specificity in the sense that several changes in microstructure will cause similar changes in the metrics provided by DTI and DTI. So if we want to achieve specificity, we need models. 
and models are first pictures and then formulas. This is we first identify what are the, the relevant uh, properties that affect the diffusion signal, and then we and then we create the formulas for them. Now, when we talk about validation, we are talking about models, because models are the ones that can be validated. Now, for the case of white matter, uh, the diffusion in white matter, we we have the standard model framework. Now. In the, in the standard model framework, we have that the axons are represented by cylinders with zero radius or six that are embedded in the extracellular compartment. And the, we can have us like a, a, a free diffusion, free diffusivity compartment. Now, when we glow all this, we have what we call the a fascicle of the standard model kernel that depends on all these parameters. No, but, but because in one bosset we have several fascicles of mutation and dispersed, we have also the fiber orientation distribution function. And then the diffusion signal is just the convolution of these two, two objects. Now, this standard model the framework includes several models proposed in literature, such as NOVI, FiberBot, uh, WNTI, SMT, and SMI. But they are now. The, the, again, the advantage of, of modeling, for in this case, standard model, is that their core goal is specificity, because the parameters of the standard model could be potential markers for, and could differentiate between pathological conditions. For example, the interaction of water fraction could be a potential marker for axonal loss. The interaction of diffusivity could be a potential marker for the uh, for uh, injury along the axons, such as bleeding. The extraction of diffusivities could be uh, potential markers for inflammation or the myelination, and the free water the 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 free water fraction could be a potential marker for edema. Also, the fiber orientation distribution could be uh, very useful for fiber tracking. It's very useful for fiber tracking or surgical planning. Now, again, if we want specificity, but in order to achieve microstructural specificity, what we our goal is to estimate all these parameters separately. This is we want. We our goal is to not uh, apply constraints in these in these uh, metrics. However, as uh, it has been reported, when we use a uh, like a typical diffusion MRI measurement, you know, like a PGS, like PGSC, pulse gradient spin echo, we have a degeneracy on these parameters. This is different combination of parameters will will uh, generate the similar signal and then applying the inverse problem solving the inverse problem is very difficult i mean um so there are several strategies that have been proposed in order to solve the degeneracy however the majority of this uh, of this method of this apply some constraints here we have uh, these methods we we can mention wnti nodi SMT, smt and smi so again, this uh, heavily rely on constraints, either in the parameters or the, F or the FOD, with only SMI not applying any constraint. Now, SMI, um, the, the SMI toolbox was developed in a group by, by Santiago Coelho. And how this how this work? Well, first, uh, we we transform the, the diffusion signal into the into the standard harmonic, uh, the spherical harmonic basis, sorry. And then, because of that, this, this uh, convolution is then a simple product. Then we remove all the rotational information by means of computing the rotational invariance. And then, uh, then we learn that we, uh, uh, there is a, by means of a, a, a quick polynomial regression, there is a mapping between the rotational invariance of the signal to the kernel parameters. Now, it is worth mentioning that this is machine learning approach. This is like this, uh, this mapping is learned in the training data and then applied on the, on the, uh, on our measurements. And finally, we can get the FOD by a spherical convolution, but here using voxel wise kernel, voxel wise kernel because we already estimated these parameters. Now, there have been some previous work regarding the validation of histology in the, in the, in the case of the, st the standard model. For example, in this in this uh, model uh, of Cuprison uh, for the myelination, there was a test. The, there was a validated the axon of water fraction using 2D electron microscopy for WNTI, in which they observe a uh, good correlation. Also, the F from Nodi was validated using a 2D light microscopy in uh, human samples with uh, multiple sclerosis. Um, 
However, the problem with this with this uh, these studies is because they only have 2D uh, microscopy, they could not validate any of the three-dimensional three-dimensional uh, objects such as the FOD or the injury along the axons. Now, the five, regarding the fiber orientation and distribution, this has been validated using 3D confocal microscopy and 3D electron microscopy. Um, yeah, here they use the orientation, they evaluated the orientation dispersion index computed by Nodi, and they uh, and they compared like uh, some orientation dispersion index that they, that they obtained from uh, ODFs computed using structural tensor analysis. However, here they only use like um, tissue without, uh, without any pathology, and also they did not compare with other metrics. So what this, what this uh, validation studies measure was mostly sensitivity. Now, in a previous work uh, using SMI, we uh, validated also uh, the, um, the interaxonal water fraction. Here we use an axonal model for axonal, uh, an animal model for axonal degeneration, in which we damage one, uh, one of the optic nerves in, in, in rat, uh, while the other was left intact. This, uh, here we use uh, several groups of animals in which uh, they, they were scanned uh, at one, seven, and three days for injury. Here, uh, when we observe the, histo the histology, we, also, we use here a 2D um, optic uh, microscopy, and we observe that there was, in fact, a, a, an axonal loss, uh, at the, uh, depending on the time in which it was uh, measured. Um, and when we compare against the interaxonal water fraction of 10 from SMI, we observe uh, um, a significant correlation. However, we also observe that there were changes in dispersion by in the P2 parameter and also in the parameter DA. Interestingly, these changes were also, were also, were also significant. And in, and in fact, the, the, the one that related with dispersion was uh, the most significant of all, was the, the larger change. However, because we did not have uh, 3D uh, information, we could not, we only have this 2DM um, uh, histological and uh, histological data. We could not validate these other these other metrics. So then we joined forces with the with the group of Alejandro Sierra in Finland. Here, uh, the idea was to do a we do a comprehensive analysis of uh, um, of the standard model parameters, and for this we use a traumatic brain injury model also for axonal degeneration. Here, uh, so this axonal, this uh, traumatic brain injury was used uh, using um, was provided using a la lateral percussion injury in which a certain region of the brain was exposed, and then by means of this device, there was uh, an impact in this exposed region of the of the brain. This was performed on three animals, while there were other two animals in which all the the same surgical um, uh, procedure was done except the the final impact. Then five months after this uh, this procedure, the in the rats were transcarded perfuse and the brain was extracted. And then we take it. This brain were taken for its vivo the MRI acquisition. And then after the MRI acquisition, they were take for a histological analysis. Here the MRI had these parameters in which we have three B values and one hundred fifty micrometer uh, isotropic voxels. Now. Regarding the histological, the histological samples, they were obtained systematically at the same region of the at the same region of all the, the animals as shown in these in these uh, pictures. Here, the strategy was uh, the strategy in order to, to measure the three the three dimensional histology was the serial block phase electron microscopy, which basically is that uh, using a, a, a three dimensional block of this tissue, it was uh, the, the phase the exposed phase was imaged. And then it was removed, and the image and removed, and then all these images were uh, captured, and then they were uh, they were stuck in order to form this 3D one. Now these samples were obtained in from the contralateral and the ipsilateral uh, size of the brain of each rat, and they uh, they contain uh, part of the corpus callosum and part of the cingulum. Now, the segmentation was performed using the deep axon pipeline developed by Ali Abdul Azadeh. Uh, and one 
very good property of this, these samples is that we have a very large number of cemented axons per sample in the order of the thousands or per region. This, together with the fact that we have a variety of samples, allow us to perform an unprecedented histological analysis. Now, from this analysis, we observe that there was a reduction in the axon density that can that, that we that uh, will provoke uh, uh, this reduction in the interaction of water fraction. Also, we compute the the axon um, the fiber orientation distribution from the axon skeleton. This is a very different approach that was have done before because before they use the structure tensor analysis not here because we have the actual cemented axon. We can compute the skeleton of the axons and then put them into like a, into an histogram over the sphere and then compute the, the spherical harmonics. Now, when comparing fiber orientation distribution, I mean, these are complex 3D objects. So in order to perform the comparison, we went through, we use the rotational invariants that have the information of this, this orientation distribution. For example, the second order uh, rotational invariance is related to the dispersion angle. For example, here, if we com we compare like the deviation of the angle from the from each one of the axons to the main bundle, and then we compare the the angle the axon of dispersion that we obtain from the from P two or the the harmonic the spherical harmonic composition, we observe that they agree uh, 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 they are not in the identity except for when using crossing fiber. Axons. Now. Well, what we observe here is, of course, that there is an increase on this dispersion, so it's a reduction in P2. Now, we also studied, we also observed that there was there were changes in the axonal morphology caused by TDI, such as an increase on, on beading and, uh, and undulation. So these were the, the changes that we observed. Here, we are measuring beading using this, uh, the torto this tortosity that basically is a uh, a relation between the 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 the, 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 the cross-sectional area varies along the axon. And the sinusity is just basically related to the emulation. Now, in uh, recent work, Ali Abdul Asade has demonstrated that this this tortosity is related directly to the fusion to the, the, the to the A by means of this formula. So applying this formula and with this correction the, for, for, the, for the dispersion cause because of the, of, the, um, of the undulation, we can predict the value for the A. So we, we expect that there, was, that there is a reduction in the A because of these, of these, uh, uh, of these changes caused by TBI. Now for the diffusion MRI analysis, we, uh, we pro pre process our data using uh, on the design of pipeline. And then we look at, at the regions, at, at the boxes that are located at the region where the, histolo the, the histology was obtained. And we look at the corpus callosum, the cingulum, and the crossing fiber of them. Now, one, one interesting aspect here is that we observe that this metrics obtained from all these estimators, SMI, WNTI, SNT, and OD, they show similar changes, you know, like a reduction on, on the interaction of water fraction and a reduction in P2 or increasing dispersion. So all of them kind of agree. But they demonstrate quantitative differences among the distinct estimators. So even though they are, they are supposedly estimate the same parameters because of all the constraints, because of all the strategies that they use to solve the parameters, the results are different. Now, okay, so we observe that there are changes of, of this, of this, uh, uh, in these parameters that, that are uh, what we expect from histology. However, so they, they mean that these parameters are sensitive. However, are they specific? Because that does, again, the, the promise of, of, of biophysical modeling or standard models, the specificity. So, well, because now we have metrics that are directly related to these, these, uh, these metrics, we can compare them and check if, if besides sensitivity, we have specificity. So we compare all the, the metrics obtained from histology with all the metrics obtained from the, this uh, standard model estimators. And in particular, observe the, 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 the sub matrices here, because these contain the corresponding metrics in which 
So because they are corresponding, we expect that the, the elements on the diagonal to be larger, but the elements of the diagonal to be lower, to be more significant. And we, we have, from this uh, analysis, we observe that all the, st the standard model, param the standard model uh, estimators provide parameters that correlate with the histological counterpart. So they show sensitivity. However, regarding specificity, only SMI uh, presented no cross, no cross correlation with not corresponding histological features. So SMI showed the, the large specificity in fact. Now, let's look at, at this, at each one of these, um, at, the, at the scatter plus of this. So first for the interaction of water fraction, we observe that systematically all of them overestimated uh, F in, with respect to, to 3DM. Now, what, what, could, what could it be that this, this F uh, from the MRI is above the identity line from 3DM? Well, there are, there are many things, of course. Uh, well, sorry, all of them show some correlations as in previous in previous uh, studies. But the, the reason why this this uh, this of uh, this uh, they are of the, uh, above the identity line could be because the T two is has been observed that the T two interactional is larger than the extractional. Also, could be that in in segmentation we could it not we don't not account for the unmyelinated axons. Uh, so these these are some some reasons in which why we are not over the identity line. Now regarding dispersion, we evaluate the dispersion angle. So here we also that all of them correlated with the histological counterpart, similar to our previous studies. However, SMI is on the identity line, uh, followed by none. So this, uh, I mean, this is uh, in the case of the the, the orientation dispersion is a metric that. It, we also said that it's less affected by things like, uh, like for example, the fixation or, or, the, or the, these changes because of, of uh, on the tissue because of the histological process, the, the histological processing. Uh, now, for the interactional diffusivity, we observe that all the methods also uh, show co so co uh, positive correlation with the with the histological counterpart. However, here we observe that only SMI is the SMI is the closest. To the the predicted value, what what will this be? Well, it it could be because WNTF, for example, assumes that the interactional diffusivity is lower than the extractional axial diffusivity, and SNT makes them equal. So maybe that is what is affecting these two these two parameters estimated by WNTI and SNT. Now again, especially here SMI is this is agree uh, this is agree with the Monte Carlo the Monte Carlo studies. Now, regarding the extraction of radial diffusivity, we observe contradictory results in the sense that SMI correlate positively with, with the interaction of water fraction, while, SM, while SMT and NODI correlate negatively. Now, here is important to notice that SMT and NODI could be uh, biased, be like uh, guided by this uh, tortosity constraint, while SMI does not. Now, we don't know exactly what should be the relation because it's, it's, it, this is something that is still being uh, researched. Like, what is the, the, the actual behavior of the extraction of the extraction of deficiency with respect to changes in the tissue? But one important thing to note is that SMI didn't need to apply any constraint in order to solve all the other parameters. Now, regarding the F, the F of the rotational invariance, we, also, we observe a good agreement also. Between the between the the obtained by histology against what we obtain from uh, diffusion MRI, um, and here we arrive up to the other the six uh, order harmonic. Uh, now, finally, um, although all the study that that, that that we I have done is mostly on, on next vivo data, there were the imaging the, the from uh, next from our from our group. How observe this? Uh, how apply these methods uh, on pathological conditions such as stroke that was applied on 28 patients? And for example, there was observed there were these these changes that are expected in in stroke, such as this decrease in DA that of course relates with axonal bleeding that has been observed in previous studies. So, the conclusion of of of, uh, of this is that. While diffusion MRI provides sensitivity to microstructure, 
we need by physical models in order to achieve the specificity. But again, only by physical models can be validated. Now, from comparing standard model estimated by do, by standard model parameters estimated by WNTI, NODI, SMT, and SMI against the histological counterpart, we have said that SMI achieve better sensitivity and specificity. And this is because the commonly used parameter constraints introduce bias that reduce the specificity in the other in the other estimators. And finally, these standard model parameters have shown to be useful in the study of pathological conditions. Now, uh, thank you very much. Uh, here are uh, a picture of my group. <laughs> this is how we look when we do the same. So, uh, thank you very much, and I open to questions. Thank you very much. That was a fantastic talk. I, that was something that I was always uh, looking like uh, 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 validating the models with the data. That was great. So, uh, Olivier, do we have a, a question for Dr. Coronado? Uh, yeah, yeah, we have one question from Vinod Kumar who asks, the human brain may have more intricate and complex axonal organization than a mouse. Uh, do we need better validation with closer animal models of the human brain's axonal organization, or do you think this is enough? Interesting question. Uh, <laughs> okay, yeah, I mean, when when you when you mention complex, you mean like you mean like regarding the the you know the the the, the crossings and all the the, the the you know the that that that's what it means because for example the the, the thing is like uh, one part is like the fiber orientation distribution that's one thing that is done by that you, that is uh, obtained by this uh, FOD spherical harmonics blah, blah, blah. but regarding the, the the parameters I mean like it has been observed that the, the parameters in the standard model in the kernel are very good in, in are very good in order to explain the diffusion in my thing you know because at the end it, it all depends on what is this the what are we sensitive. You know, we can put a lot of things in our model, a lot, a lot of things, but that doesn't mean that they will be, you know, like. Uh, so, in the case of the in the human and and and, uh, and mouse, I mean, yeah, probably you can be you can you can use like uh, monkeys or something, but but I I believe that at this level is uh, using uh, using rats at the corpus callosum of the cingulum is is good is good enough. I mean, maybe the the, the, big, the biggest thing that I that I uh, maybe a little off will be like the size of the box. You know, that is maybe uh, like the size of the box is a little small. So probably that that could be something affecting you have you have less 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 actions. So it would be a little different. But but I'm not so sure how much, you know, because until now it's what we observe, what has been observed in animal models has been observed in pathological conditions in uh, using you know in vivo uh, studies. Great, thank you. Um, another question from Jin Chen, who asks, when there is axonal damage, like in MS, are diffusion model assumptions being affected? And if so, are those models still valid? Okay, yeah, this is, and this is a great question, because, yeah, I mean, what, the, the, the thing is this. Yeah, standard model, assume, uh, okay, it was created, you assuming like uh, like normal, normal tissue, you know, with no damage. And of course, when there is pathological conditions, you have, for example, increased cell and solidarity, or or other things that might might affect the 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 you know the assumptions of, of the model. But until now, we have observed good good agreement. I mean, like what we expect to observe, more or less, has been observed in humans. But of course, there is much more. Like, like if you if there is more, too much increase in, cell, in cellularity, of course, standard model doesn't account or doesn't account for. To, to too much solidarity because then you start to having a change, you start having other things that need to, need to take into account. But again, the standard model, I mean, as mentioned, it's just like right now, it's just like a, a, a framework that that puts everything together of what we know, you know, but there are many things that we still don't know. So if we learn something great, something new, great, add it, you know, but this is a little by little pressure, a little by little. All right, thank you. Um, we have a, a lot of questions. I encourage everybody to to keep those in mind when, for the discussion period. But uh, we'll go with uh, one last question. And so, uh, do these uh, acquisition and uh, do these um, uh, modeling techniques all require like similar protocols? Like, what kind of uh, acquisition is required to run these uh, 
these modeling techniques. Okay, yeah. So I, I forgot to mention that in the in the last in the last slide. For example, the the, the study done by Jim. One of the in, the most important thing that I forgot to mention is that the protocol was a simple one thousand like two shell one thousand two thousand. So already with that, you can already estimate very good estimate F and very good estimate like BA and P2. But if you want to reliable estimate like very, like more accurately estimate the, the, the parameters of the standard model, of course, is uh, you need higher B values or you need like uh, uh, using waveforms. I mean, yeah, that will help a lot to the estimation of the value. In fact, uh, we encourage, I mean, the, the, the work of Santiago actually is and the SMI can handle using um, multiple T, for example, for the for a better estimation of the of the, of the um, free water fraction and also waveforms and high B values in order for for estimate more reliable the 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 for example the extraction and diffusivities. So yeah, I mean you need that you need good protocol, but even with a protocol of 1000, 2000, uh, as Gene did. You can rely on estimate, or in my case, I also use PGSE in the case of the these validations, and you can still estimate reliable some parameters. Great, thank you.